continuing the analysis of the poem by John Dryden, Alexander Feast in the Untuning of the Sky, Part 2, page um, 417. The third stanza celebrates Bacchus. Uh -huh. hmm. Where's Bacchus? Uh -huh. Starting out with this report of what subject it was that the sweet musician uh, actually sang and then moving almost imperceptibly into the invocation itself of Bacchus. Quote, now give the hot boy's breath, he comes, he comes. Uh, he, we are not told, uh, as we are in the fifth section, that harmonia, it actually was that Timotheus played. We may assume that it was the Ionian which the Lydian, with the Lydian, that in section 5 becomes the erotic mode and was designated by Plato as one of the softer drinking harmonies. Uh -huh. You think it's erotic? Uh, uh, where is Bacchus? We read by by Bacchus. He said, now give the hot boy's breath. He comes, he comes. Bacchus, ever fair and young, drinking joys, did first ordain. Bacchus, blessings are a treasure. Drinking is the soldier's pleasure. Rich the treasure, sweet the pleasure, sweet is pleasure after pain. He, well, what is he saying here? It's soft or drinking harmony, says something from the Republic, page 398. Huh? Plato. Plato recommends uh, Ionian and with the uh, Lydian to go with the wine. Uh -huh. Dryden has carefully allowed only wind instruments to occur in this section. The fourth section recounts Alexander's hallucinatory, perhaps drunken, but whether on wine or music. What's he drunk on, dear, or both? I imagine he's probably had wine and music. <laughs> Maybe he's meditating. Oh, Alexander, at this party? Are you kidding me? Revelry fought all his battles over again, and he thought all his battles over again. And thrice he routed him. Thrice all his foes, thrice he slew the slain. It's interesting, he slews, slew the slain. <laughs> But then we are told, uh, <laughs> the master saw the madness rise, his glowing cheeks, his ardent eyes, and while he heaven and earth defied, changed his hand and checked his pride. He chose a mournful muse, soft pity to infuse. <laughs> Is he changing the mode again? <laughs> This may would have been a Mixolydian mode uh, that that uh, Timotheus employed to chasten his king's exuberance by using it to accompany the remainder uh, reminder of the death of Darius, which had, according to Plutarch, moved uh, Alexander deeply. His song of Darius fallen, 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 fallen. fallen. From his high estate causes tears to come to the eyes of Alexander, but in the next trophy we are told that the musicians sang in Lydian measures to soothe the king and turn him to amorous feelings. <laughs> now he's changing him again. All you have to do is change the mode. <laughs> It is interesting that Dryden should have called the Lydian melodic mode a metrical one, but the additional meanings of dance and means, as well as the rhyme with pleasures, operate to enforce the equivalent rather than the identity of the two. Were he sung his toil and trouble, Honor, but an empty bubble, never ending, still beginning, fighting still and still destroying. If the world be worth thy winning, think, oh, think it worth enjoying. Lovely Thais sits beside thee. Take the good the gods provide thee. 
and many rend the skies with loud applause so love was crowned but music won the cause uh -huh. he he feels that music wins uh -huh. Here again the strophe moves into Timotheus's song itself. This time it is as much a much moral argument as pure exaltation. It is a little like a cavalier lyric about love and arms inserted into the ode at this point. The theme of Mars and Venus at any rate served to introduce the whole scene and the Sixth trophy, the concluding one of Timothy's uh, story, ends itself with a comparison of Thais to the greatest heroine of war fought all for love after the king had sunk in sleep into the breast of his courtesan. Timothy stuck the golden wire again, struck the golden wire again. This time he, we should guess, with Phrygian strains. <laughs> Phrygion. These are different modes. They're like scales in music. See, he's using mu music to change the, the mood. Huh? You don't have to explain. Why do you explain? You think people don't understand? Well, they might not know Phrygian mode. Huh? Did you read it? You read it before. Certainly the prosody. Prosody. This is for, for if you're expert music theorist. Uh -huh. We're talking about music theory. Certainly the prosody of the stanza is most varied and elaborate. Uh, revenge, revenge is the musician's text. And you know what prosody means? <laughs> hmm? Poetry, prosody. writing. It's a, uh, it's a good word. What is it? Sophia. What is Sophia? Prosodia. What's pro-Sophia? What? Pros or the, or the, or the song. Tongue? Song. Song. The songness of the stanza. All right, if you want to give the Greek words, the deaf revenge, revenge is the musician's text in a full complement of fury, snakes, a ghastly band, each a torch in his hand, conjured up in the minds of all by the ecstatic mode. Incite the king to wreck that avenge upon the very palace in which he had been reveling. Behold, how they toss the touches on high, how they point to the Persian abodes and glittering temples of their hostile gods. Uh, the princes applaud with a furious joy, and the king seized a flambeau with zeal to destroy. Thais led the way to light him to his prey, and like another Helen, fired another Troy. <laughs> My goodness. It is love, then, which concludes the story as it opened it. In the final stroke, we are given the climatic mention of Timotheus thus long ago. Here heaving bellows learned to blow, while organs yet were moot. Mute Timotheus to his breathing flute and sounding lyre could swell the soul to rage or kindle soft desire. Hmm. The flute and lyre mentioned together may, of course, stem from the traditional confusion of the two Timotheus figures, historical lyricist and the fictional Aet or Aulet's it's like a instrument, A-U-L-E-T-E-S. How do you pronounce that? Hmm? Oh, Aulet. But it is also harps, uh, back to the opening theme of love consummating the warrior's victory with perhaps an overtone of Horace's second epog with its quarat and bebom. Sonate, mixtum, tipis, carmine, lera, ac, dorium, lilis, barabarum, wherein the battle of Actium was to be celebrated with the mingled musics of a gravely victorious and frenziedly celebratory nature. 
But Timotheus is finally outdone in a sudden intrusion of St. Cecilia that on the surface seems rather unconvincing. She is complimented as having, quote, enlarged the former narrow bounds and added length to solemn sounds. That is, as the combining the virtues of classical measures and the benefits of the music of Christian worship. <laughs> it cannot be for this only that Dryden demands. Uh -huh. Quote, Let old Timotheus yield the prize, or both divide the crown. He raised a mortal to the skies. He drew an angel down. St. Johnson remarked that this conclusion is vicious. Uh -huh. hmm. The music of Timotheus, which raised a mortal to the skies, had only a metaphorical power. That of Cecilia, which drew an angel down, had a real effect. The crown, therefore, could not reasonably be divided. To debate this conclusion might not necessarily entail an excursion into ontology to show that for Dryden the power was metaphorical in both cases, but such a debate should be avoided in any event. The final appearance of St. Celia as a particular sort of deus ex machina must be understood as operating within the convention of the St. Cecilia's Day music meetings, with which Dryden was, of course, familiar. She triumphs over Timotheus, or only meets his accomplishment. Dryden is significantly non-committal. <laughs> oh, no through the antithesis of the final conceit, but the intention of this seems quite clear. The reference to her attraction of the angel is casually tossed off, as if to indicate that this story was an accepted part of what was almost a liturgy of these music meetings. The close of the ode is a conventional one, a ritual in itself, and the final piece of wit serves to tie the whole ode and its subject into its proper occasional function. But in other sense, it is indeed Saint Cecilia who has been unthroned. <laughs> That's terrible. He unthroned her. Hmm. 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 What do you think of that? Hmm. I have to stop there to make a third part. Uh -huh. We are reading all about Dryden's Alexander Feast and the power of music in poetry of the English poetry of the 15th, 16th 17th century England in the untuning of the sky. Mm -hmm.